All right. So, uh, good morning, everyone, or good, good afternoon morning. from Europe. Um, yeah, uh, first, uh, short word of, uh, word of correction. Um, PyStorm and MU68 does not boot into Linux. Uh, we don't have any Linux at all. So, MU68 is just uh, by itself. All right. So, uh, today about MU68, what's new, what's up with the project uh, since last time I was at AmiWest and how it goes together with the PyStorm. Um, the presentation will uh, contain a few parts. First, short introduction, uh, how we met together, how it all started, and then about design goals of the accelerator, uh, what hardware do we support, uh, what troubles do we have to overcome, and also some numbers like benchmarks and so on. Um, finally, I will uh, tell you what we are working on, on at the moment and what, also what are the plans for the future um, of PyStorm and MU68. And finally, I will give some acknowledgement. Uh, okay, so let me start with the introduction. Um, so, as you remember from my last AmiWest uh, presentation, um, we have started more or less in 2020 or uh, 2019. Um, November 2020, uh, both MU68 and PyStone project have met together. Um, it was the point where, where I was more or less ready with MU68, but I was lacking the hardware which I could use to run it on. On the other hand, um, there was already some interest in Amiga accelerators based on the ARM processors rising. And at this point, Claude, uh, Claude Schwarz had the hardware I was needing and I had the MU68 so we had a co cooperation which was basically just unavailable. Um, if you remember properly, um, the last time when I was presenting MU68 and PyStorm, it was just the very beginning. Um, it was still 2021 but at this point only initial support was provided for MU68. Uh, many features were either not present or still lacking, and there were a lot of problems with compatibility of games, demos, uh, and other kind of software. And uh, what we also had was a relatively small user base of uh, MO68 with Python together, so um, we were in the need of uh, some kind of acceleration, uh, some kind of increase of the user base so that we have more, uh, more testers and more uh, feedback from the users. Okay, so this is how we met together and this is more or less where I have left you last time during AmiWest with my presentation. And since then, uh, many things have just changed or improved uh, definitely. Um, so, what we have now is the open source accelerator. It's important to emphasize that, uh, that we have both MO68 and PyStorm, which are open source. Um, and we give them for free and we are happy if people uh, use them, build them and do whatever they like with them. Uh, so, what is the PyStorm in this uh, combination? PyStorm is FPGA with additional hardware, which provides translation layer between uh, Motorola 68K bus and Raspberry Pi. On the other hand, M68 provides a translation layer between Motorola code and ARM processor code. Um, at this point, what has changed from the uh, from the last time? Uh, last time I had both 64-bit uh, and 32-bit uh, ARM support. At the moment, the 32-bit ARM support has been dropped, and uh, I'm focusing only on 64-bit uh, ARM architecture. Um, okay, so Raspberry Pi hardware is exposed uh, in the lower part of the address space in the, in the lower 32 bits, uh, which means it's also accessible for the M68 code. Um, as I have said at the very beginning, it's the bare metal code, so uh, M68 does not need any Linux to run uh, when Raspberry Pi started, the very first thing which was loaded for the ARM processor is the MO68. And this is how it stays for all the time. Um, MO68 is accessing 34-bit uh, uh, Amiga address space uh, in a way of uh, MIMIU uh, page fault exceptions. Um, I mean, this part of the memory is just not mapped on the ARM processor and any access there uh, is uh, resulting in a page fault uh, trap. And the Mimeo handler is using PyStorm to talk to the Amiga. 
Um, just a short reminder how it's working. So MO68 main execution loop um, is taking the program counter from a Motorola CPU and is looking um, if it has already translated the part of the code which is uh, pointed by the address. Um, if this is the case, then the ARM code is just uh, simply executed. If this, if this is not the case, uh, then the translation process is starting. Um, the translation process um, is relatively fast because um, I'm not doing awfully time-intensive optimizations, which are known, for example, from uh, other just-in-time compilers. Uh, the optimizations which we have um, have a major impact on the performance, but they are not really very, very time consuming. So what we do there uh, with MO68, first of all, the, the most important part is the elimina elimination of, of uh, condition code calculations. Um, then the next part is uh, the field update of the program counter register, which does not have to be act uh, updated every second or every single opcode. Um, we have also subroutine inlining, plop unrolling, and instruction merging. Um, what has also changed or improved from the last time? Um, in case of the code which is executed from the chip memory, there is no unlining or uh, unrolling of the loops uh, because this greatly uh, improves, or the, not improves, it increases the time which is needed to access the memory. So this kind of optimization is just disabled for this part of the code. Um, so, what is this condition code elimination? Um, this is the most major problem when you emulate the MO60, uh, M, uh, Motorola processors because nearly every single opcode is affecting the conditions co uh, condition codes of the processor. Uh, and on the other hand, only a few opcodes in your program flow depend on this uh, on these condition codes, which means there are a lot of unnecessary calculations which just can be avoided if possible. And you see here the small example which I have also shown during the last AMI West, um, where you see that every or more or less every uh, almost every single opcode is updating the condition codes. And after the elimination which we have in MO68, you see that only there are two places which need somehow uh, to update the codes or use the codes. Um, so this is the very, very great improvement of the generated code from the ARM side. On the other hand, uh, we allow also to inline the code which we have. Um, there you see an example. Uh, you have the three subsequent blocks of the uh, Motorola code which are translated to the single uh, just-in-time block where the subsequent blocks from the Motorola code are just attached to the same block. And if the inlining distance is too large, then uh, as you can see here with this JIT block D, um, the inlining is not taking place. On the other hand, uh, we do not uh, only merge the blocks in, in such way. We can also inline small subroutines if they are uh, detected. Um, if the target address uh, is computable during the com uh, compile time of the MO68, then the inlining is taking place. As you can see here, uh, if there is, for example, a branch to the subroutine, the subroutine can be put into the translated code directly without any need of jumping. In this case, jumping would mean uh, that the um, main loop of the just-in-time translator has been entered, the new block has to be searched for, and so on and so forth. Um, and the last uh, important uh, optimization which we are performing is lob unrolling. It means, in this case, MO68 attempts to align itself on the beginning of the loop, and the loop can be repeated several times. This is a runtime configuration option. Um, in this case, uh, if you have a small tight loop in the M M68 code, the loop can be repeated several times just to avoid uh, branching. On the other hand, this inner loop, I mean the jump to the beginning of the, um, uh, of the loop, uh, will, uh, will be performed without going out from the block of the code. Um, the corresponding instructions are added added to the translated ARM code directly. Um, the last very important part which has appeared uh, in MO68 more or less uh, one month ago is instruction cache. 
Um, the problem with MO68, which we had all the time, was the performance of the all the games or demos, for example, uh, uh, especially from uh, for the code which was running from the chip memory. The one the one problem was, uh, for example, this inlining range, um, because we had to scan in advance um, the code in the memory, and if the most of the code was in the chip memory, we had to perform many accesses to the chip RAM which was not really so fast and it was affecting the performance in a very negative way. Um, what we have added recently is the instruction cache, which is used in a little bit illegal way from the chip memory, um, but it's still working. Um, it's the way set associative instruction cache with uh, 128 sets at eight ways and 16, by, uh, 16 bytes per cache line. So it's uh, 16 kilobytes in the total. Um, using uh, pseudo last recently used uh, algorithm to optimize uh, the flushing of the cache lines if there are some other in the need. Um, it is used only during the translation phase and checks, uh, check summing uh, phase of the code. Um, the cache is also automatically invalidated during the rise to the chip memory and as a result we have a great greatly improved uh, translation time and verification time of the code which is running from the chip memory and finally um, what's most important for the users is that with this instruction cache uh, most of the old gamos, uh, demos or games which had problems before are working now without any issues so uh, when speaking about issues um, in case of uh, mo68 and pystorm um, we have to deal uh, not only with the most recent software um, or modern software in terms of Amiga, but also with kind of uh, old software, old games, uh, old demos, uh, which contained a lot of uh, optimizations, which are at the moment not really so great for MS68, for example, self-modifying code, which was used really a lot um, in the old software. Um, most of old uh, or many of the old demos games were targeting only the pure uh, 6800 as a target and they were uh, or they still have a problems uh, even with uh, motorola um, 040 or 060. Um, in many cases mo68 with python together was either too fast or too slow to operate properly and it's not so easy to match the performance of the MO68 at the same time with the required slowness, I must, uh, I must say it uh, this way, um, uh, required to run, so, uh, for example, all old software. Um, what we have provided is a tool to adjust most of the important parameters of, of MO68 uh, during the runtime, which means you can make M68 more compatible or more, more slow uh, without any need to restart your Amiga or whatever you would like to do. Um, so let me just briefly go through the options which you have or which you can change. One of them is the instruction depth, which means uh, how many M M68K instructions can be put into the single block of the translated code. Um, this value can vary from 1 up to 256. Um, the low values can make MO68 in generally pretty, they allow you to uh, increase the chances of detection of self-modifying code. Um, inlining range and inline loop count uh, are the features which I have mentioned already before, which means low values reduce the occurrences or chances for inlining. On the other hand, um, this is uh, this options have uh, effectively zero impact at the moment in the new versions of mo68 uh, for the code executed from the chip memory because these are disabled automatically um, another important feature is this elimination of uh, uh, condition codes uh, cal uh, calculations this can be adjusted with the new parameter which was introduced more or less one month ago uh, which is the CCR scan dip, which means how many instructions, Motorola instructions in advance will be scanned uh, to decide if the computation of conditional codes is necessary or not. Um, low numbers uh, result in less, uh, less effective elimination of the computations. On the other hand, 
um, large numbers uh, will mean that a lot of code has to be read from the chip memory, for example, or in general from from the memory in advance. Uh, for every single opcode which is translated, it would mean, for example, you have to read something like uh, 200 or 300 bytes in advance, which can impact the performance. Um, also important notice is the large numbers uh, for this uh, scan deep uh, shall be avoided in case of uh, self-modifying code, especially self-modifying code uh, happening in the very short range like it is, for example, in the case of the state-of-the-art demo, which is modifying, where the one instruction is modifying exactly the subsequent uh, instruction. Um, so in order to avoid any trouble with detecting if the condition codes have to be calculated or not, this number has to be put as low as possible. Um, okay, so what do we can adjust to? Um, are the slow chip option which means uh, if this is activated, every single instruction which is executed on the ARM side already is also reading its own opcode from the original uh, memory location, uh, which means if the code is executed from the fast memory, it's fast. On the other hand, uh, if it's executed from the chip memory, you will have generic slowdown for every single opcode which is executed. Can be used just to make M68 slower if, if needed. Um, and the last two options, which are pretty old already, is the soft flash possibility, which does not empty the uh, just-in-time cache. It will just invalidate it uh, so that before the code is executed, it will be rechecked if the original code has changed or not. And finally, the fast cache, when it's disabled, um, a checksum of every single translated block of the memory will be verified prior to the execution. Finally, the last but not least uh, important change um, was found uh, in the uh, pinball games. Um, so many old Motorola code was using busy, lo uh, busy loops um, to introduce uh, small delays into the code. As you can uh, guess, such small busy loops, especially with uh, lob unrolling and aligning of the loops to the start of the translated arm block, would execute awfully fast, um, way too fast for the um, purposes which were uh, where they were designed for. Um, so the busy loops were just not working with MO68. And we have added with help of uh, some other guys, like, for example, Parai from uh, EAB. Um, we have added the option to make only this kind of busy loops much slower. You can see it on the right side in the example. There you can see three additional memory accesses. Um, the result of this access is uh, not used for anything. So uh, I have just put a dash there. And uh, if the MO68 will detect such a tight DBF loop, it will introduce additional memory reads just to make it slower and to make it operating as, uh, as required. Um, and this is the huge change which will be introduced in the next uh, release of MO68. It's not yet available uh, to the download, but uh, it's a matter of a few days. Um, so, uh, what we also have are the performance counters, um, which can be accessed anytime from the uh, Motorola side of the code. Uh, one of them is the co uh, is counting number of executed M68 instructions. The other one is uh, counting the ARM processor instructions executed. And the tool which you can see here is also showing the effectiveness, which is the ratio between the ARM instructions and the Motorola instructions executed at the time. Um, so, for example, if for a single Motorola 68 instruction, only one ARM instruction would be generated, it would mean that the effectiveness is uh, at the 100%. On the other hand, in this example here below, you can see that there was a at this moment of the of taking screenshot, the effectiveness of 15, 15%. It's still pretty nice, but um, there are also cases where it's much faster than here. Okay, so this is about MO68, and let's get back to the PyStorm and MO68 together. 
So what do we have now? Uh, during the last Ami West, basically only the classic uh, Python for Amiga 500 was uh, existing. Um, it's still existing and it's still uh, being supported by us. Um, the classic PyStorm is working on the uh, 6800 bus uh, and it can be installed in Amiga 500, 500 plus, uh, 600, 2000 and 1000. Um, it allows you to use uh, Raspberry Pi 0 2, Raspberry Pi 3 in all variations and that's all. Um, if you use uh, not MO68 but uh, Musashi, which is the interpreter which was used previously by the PyStorm, and this is the one which is using Linux, uh, you can also put this PyStorm in Atari or Macintosh uh, computers. And then we have um, PyStorm 32 Lite, which is using uh, 68020 uh, bus. And this one is designed for Amiga uh, 1200. Um, it allows you to use the same uh, raspberries as the classic Python, but it also allows you to use Raspberry P uh, Pi 4 or CM4. Um, just let me uh, explain it shortly. Um, the name Python 32 Lite is a little bit um, confusing. It's an uh, unfortunate uh, name uh, somehow because it suggests you that it's the light, it's the smaller, slower, whatever version of the PyStorm 32. It is not. Um, when the PyStorm 32 was created, um, there was the breakdown of the uh, component market. So we had the problems to get the FPGA and so on. Many parts were just not possible to buy anymore. And Claude had designed PyStorm 32 light, which means in this uh, in this case, light is lower cost, but same speed and more Raspberry Pi models supported. Um, because the original Python 32 was meant only for CM4 modules, and the Python 32 light you can put, as you can see on this picture, Raspberry Pi 3, 4, whatever you would like. Um, we have also designed a special CM4 adapter, which is effectively making uh, the original Python 32 out of the light version, and it allows you to install CM4 modules. Um, it allows you to connect HDMI output on the back of your Amiga um, and many other very interesting features. Um, okay, so that's the PyStorm, um, but maybe you would like to see how well it performs. So let me show you some numbers first. Um, I'm sorry for showing this info. Um, it's not a good benchmark. Um, I mean, it has so, uh, some drawbacks and it's not really so uh, giving a real feeling of the speed of MO68. Um, but I have also shown you some other results. You may see uh, DNET C uh, results with uh, computing the keys. Um, OGR is the, or LC572 are doing more or less uh, 2 million nodes per second, which is all already very, very great number. Um, you can see example of Quake 2 uh, running at more than 30 FPS at the resolution 850 times 480, which is also pretty great. Uh, we were doing the Amiga 38 meeting at the last week, and we had many people just playing uh, Quake 2 with our Pi Storms, and they were really happy uh, with the resolution and with the speed. Um, the memory bandwidth, uh, in case of CM4, in this case, is in the range of 4 gigabyte per second. On the other hand, accessing chip memory is still not so great. Uh, writing to the chip memory is already fast at the maximum, which is possible with the, uh, with the Amiga 1200. On the other hand, reading from the chip memory is still a little bit problematic, but we are working on a solution to make it better. And just uh, for the sys info, um, What's important to note is that in case of uh, CM4 or Raspberry Pi 4, uh, you get the performance in the range of one MIPS on Motorola side per one megahertz of the ARM processor speed. So you can see the result here. You can just find out out of, out of guess that the CM4, which was used to, to take the screen, screenshot, was uh, running at the 1.5 gigahertz. Um, I have mentioned the Quake, uh, so let's just have a look how it performs at the lower resolution. 
And you can see here the performance is just uh, more than enough to have a very pleasant game. Um, also, at high resolutions, is still not a problem. So if you like to use it, uh, just have a fun with it and play the games which you were not able to play, be uh, play before. You can see here it was 70 FPS at the uh, 320 times 240 resolution. Um, getting a bit a little bit higher also gives you the speed which you would like to have and which is just more than enough to have a pleasant game. Um, a much better benchmark than SysInfo is, for example, AIBB. Uh, here you can see the problems with accessing the chip memory. I mean, not the problems, but the performance. Uh, um, these are on par with uh, regular Amiga. On the other hand, everything that is using CPU only is just uh, blazing fast, I would say. So once again, a Leibs drawing, you may see the chip memory is not the fastest one. On the other hand, if we do the uh, CPU computations, we are just, uh, I would say, pretty fast. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so what we also have uh, um, is the performance, which is high enough to allow you to play uh, 720p videos, uh, what you can see here. I don't know if you have the sound or not. Uh, it's not really so important. It's the video which is playing just, uh, just on MO68 only with uh, Motorola 68K code um, in the resolution of uh, 1280 times uh, 720 pixel. And as you may see here, the Motorola code is running at more or less 500 to 600 MIPS. Um, the ARM processor is uh, still not used uh, for 100% and it's fast enough just to have the pleasure, uh, pleasure and watch the videos. Uh, smaller resolution videos can be uh, watched uh, for example, if you like to see two of them at once, it's not a problem. Um, what we also have are the demos. Uh, many of them were not working previously. Um, I don't know if it's loud for you or not. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, the demos are just working at the full speed of uh, any very good Amiga accelerator. Um, oh, let me just turn it off. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's also fast enough to give you some OpenGL computations by CPU only. We still don't have any acceleration in this case, um, but still it's fast enough just to enjoy it, uh, even if only CPU is computating. And finally, uh, for the classics, this is a kind of old video already. It's, uh, I don't know, something like uh, half a year more or less. Uh, where I was playing with CM4 overclocked a little bit and I have just uh, started UAE emulator on Amiga uh, using uh, CM4 um, just to run, run something old. I mean with the most recent changes to MO68 you can run this demo which will just run in a second uh, directly on MO68 but this, that was just a small try. Um, and it was still working uh, more or less pretty well, I would say. Um, so this would be an option for running, for example, very old software, which is not behaving as you would like to have it. Um, it's performing still pretty well, I would say, when you emulate Amiga on Amiga um, and both are uh, on the Motorola phone. Yeah, so this demo was just working fine um, with some glitches in the case of the... Um, of few scenes, but on the other hand, performing fast enough just to have the pleasure. Um, yeah, so this is working and uh, small res resolution videos, I, as you will see in a few seconds, are also not a problem. Okay, so another one, uh, just having the pleasure of watching video and what you see here, I was flashing the just-in-time cache uh, just to show you that uh, there was no jitter, uh, which some could say uh, in case of just-in-time translation, you have a jitter if you just flash the cache or whatever. Um, the jitter is there, but it's uh, slow enough to not notice, uh, notify it. Okay, so um, that's about the numbers and Amiga and beyond, what we are working on and what we are going to work in the future. Um, so, at the moment, we have a uh, 
few uh, hardware projects running. Uh, one is improvement of the FPGA firmware uh, for faster read accesses, especially for the chip memory, which I have already mentioned. Um, also, Claude is working on new protocol for Raspberry Pi, which, will, which should improve the communication between Raspberry Pi and MO60, uh, Raspberry Pi and PyStorm. Um, this should have a very nice uh, impact on the uh, reading uh, from the chip memory in case of MO68. Um, and we have also uh, uh, two projects which are directly hardware. One, uh, also from Claude, is uh, the frame grabber for RGB, RGB signal from the Amiga, which will use or which, which is going to use the camera interface of Raspberry Pi. This would give you the near, near to zero latency between your video signal and uh, HDMI output from the Raspberry Pi. It would give you the uh, possibility to use only one display attached to the HDMI. Um, and also what I'm working on is the CM4 board for the classic Pi Storm. Um, on the side of MO68, we are working on improving the uh, FPU support still. I mean, we have made already very, very uh, large amount of improvements, but we, are, we still are facing some problems with the uh, uh, precise calculations. Uh, um, we are going to improve the compatibility even more. Uh, even more. I mean, at the moment, uh, some colleagues have tested something like 1,000 uh, games and demos for classic Amiga, and only few were not working properly or misbehaving. Uh, so we are already pretty great with the compatibility, uh, but still there is some roof, uh, room for improvement. Um, another one uh, is the video core acceleration because the video driver at the moment is not using any kind of acceleration at all. And also um, I'm working on new drivers for Amiga OS. One of them is Wi-Fi and Ethernet. Ethernet only in the case of uh, CM4 and Raspberry Pi 4 at the moment um, because in case of uh, Raspberry Pi 3, if you would like to use Ethernet connector, you have to use the uh, USB driver first because the Ethernet is part of the USB hub. And the last part uh, which will appear in the future is uh, NVMe uh, driver for CM4 in case of Python 32 uh, with the adapter board which I have designed. Uh, so just for the uh, video acceleration, let me show you how it's going to look like. Um, this is the screen mode uh, 2556 uh, times uh, 1440 and I have opened a large window with the large bitmap there, uh, more or less 8K resolution and as you have seen the screen dragging was just uh, immediate and also scrolling of the image is uh, without any problem. This is already with the acceleration but it's not available to the public yet because as you may see there, there are some glitches on the screen and I will release it once it's ready and usable. Okay, so um, this is what we are working on and I have also uh, already mentioned that MO68 RC2 will be available soon. Um, this will have some uh, great improvements in the compatibility. Um, our colleagues on Discord channel have uh, already tested uh, some very nasty programs uh, and demos and so on. And what's working with this new version of MO68 are also very, very old uh, software examples like this one, working at the moment already without any trouble. Um, and also, uh, for example, the juggler and so on. So you can at the moment already run very, very old software from Amiga on your MO68 with the Pi Storm together. Um, okay, and the last but not least, uh, our small pet project for the future, uh, but it's for a really very distant future, will be the Pi Storm in mini ITX form without Amiga, uh, but on the other hand with multiple FPGA chips which will communicate uh, with each other using the 16 or 32-bit synchronous bus and the Amiga custom chips are going to be implemented in this board uh, in different FPGA modules. So we are not going to use only one module for everything, but we are going to use something like uh, it was known for the from the Amiga where you have 
small FPGA chips or where you have a chipset consisting of many parts and every part is responsible only for one or two things. Um, yeah, but uh, as I have said, uh, not even rough uh, estimation when it would be available or well, where, uh, when we will go, uh, when we will work on that is uh, at the moment uh, possible. Okay, uh, so before I um, finish, um, in case or uh, in case anyone would like to ask, how about Raspberry Pi Five? Um, don't hold your breath. Um, the problem with Raspberry Five is. Uh, it's pretty new. It's not already available to buy. Uh, we have ordered some, but they are not there yet. And the problem with Raspberry Pi 5 is uh, basically it's uh, Southbridge, which is on separated processor and it's in interconnected with the main CPU using PCI Express bus. Um, the bus is very fast. It's uh, just great. It can do several gigabytes per second of the bulk transfer. On the other hand, it has a setup latency, which is pretty high. I mean, uh, you can transfer one gigabyte of data within one second without any trouble with PCI Express. But on the other hand, it will take you more or less one microsecond to prepare the transfer. And in case of the PyStorm or Amiga, where we are doing quite a lot of small transfers uh, uh, having every time a one microsecond of delay will be just uh, dramatic. And at the moment we assume that Raspberry Pi 5 in the form as, as it is now will be not really usable for uh, us. On the other hand, I have some hope that CM5 module, which will appear in a few months maybe, will be may be usable for us. I mean, if they don't put this RP1 processor on CM5 module, then it should be fine. On the other hand, if they do, then we just can't use Raspberry Pi 5 and we will have to look for something else. Okay, so um, that's uh, more or less uh, all about uh, Raspberry Pi and MO68. Um, at this place, I would like to thank uh, all the su uh, supporters uh, from the Patreon. Um, the past ones and the and the current ones, and if you would uh, if you like M68, if you like Python, uh, your support is gladly welcome. I mean, in this case, support is uh, use it, like it, fork it, test it, sponsor it, star it, or just just simply love it. Uh, that uh, that you like M68, that you like Python is basically the best reward from uh, for us. And also, I would like uh, at this place to thank uh, all who gave the votes for Amiga 38, where we have just we have been awarded uh, with the first place in the category of the hardware. All right. So, thank you for the uh, for your patience. Uh, for your, for, uh, thank you for listening uh, listening to me. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we're going to do something a little different today for questions. What we're going to do is uh, add a microphone. So if you have a question for Michael, uh, just walk up here and, and grab the mic. Are there any questions? After that whole presentation, I was, I, I had some questions on registers. We'll take those off. Uh, anything? Wow. Do you have a question? Okay. Seb's got a question. Just pick up the mic and flip the switch. It's not on the speakers. There's a switch on there. Oh, I have a question. Hi. Um, not yet. I was looking at the power PC uh, more or less, but it's not or uh, not yet planned. Maybe somewhere in the future, but I am not entirely sure if we need it. Um, I mean, if there are enough reasons to implement it, I can consider adding it. But on the other hand. Um, at the moment, there are many other places which are more important now uh, than PowerPC, so uh, it, it does not have a high pr uh, priority. Any other questions? Uh, well, I, I'll just say thank you so much for your work. I mean, I think it's energized the classic side tremendously and opened up new possibilities. Seeing a workbench running at 4,000 by 4,000 was pretty uh, pretty insane. Um, 
for those who are at the show, uh, Matthew has Pi Storms for sale at his table. They're not very expensive, which is another magical part about this, is, is it's not like an O30 card where you're dealing with hundreds of dollars and then you got to buy a chip um, or an O60 card. They're available for sale. There's a 1200 running a Pi Storm uh, with a Pi 3 uh, on the, the show floor. Um, thank you, Michael. Really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Big round of applause. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a very short break, and we're going to transition over to Dan, who's going to show off his new game that he's working on for OCS Classic Amigas. Thanks, Michael. Bye. Bye. Thanks.